This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, this is Sandy Johnson Myers in the original 1978 Halloween, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. You like girls, Tommy? No one's home. Let's go upstairs. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Kim Gottlieb Walker. She was the still t- photographer on John Carpenter's early horror classics, Halloween, The Fog, Christine, also Escape from New York, which is sci-fi. And um, she also was a still photographer on Family Ties, Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, she started out, you know, um, uh, shooting um, rock and roll stars like Rod Stewart, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, um, so many great people, and we're going to talk about all that stuff today. I had reached out to Kim uh, last October, but we were right in the middle of the pandemic and the election, and she just was not feeling it at the time. So I circled back just a few weeks ago, and she said, okay, let's do it, and we're going to talk today, and it's going to be spectacular. So uh, yeah, here is my interview with Kim Gottlieb Walker. Hey, Kim, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? I am spectacular. I dialed the wrong number, so (laughs) sorry I'm a couple minutes late. (laughs) Uh, No problem. Yes, this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. It's my pleasure. So going back in time, I read that uh, you attended UC Berkeley, and that's where your uh, photography journey began with uh, taking 35mm stills. Did you have any interest in photography before that? Well, my mother had been a photographer's assistant before she married my father, and uh, my father had um, uh, um, a giant camera that, that he used to take my baby pictures, so there was a lot of photography going on at home. And uh, when I left for Berkeley, my mother gave me her little fixed-lens 35mm camera so I could document my freshman year. And uh, then the free speech movement happened, and so I ended up photographing Joan Baez singing to the crowd and, wow. you know, people taking over the administration building. It was very exciting, so it was really my first taste of journalistic photography. Yeah, so you wanted to be a, um, a photojournalist then? Um. I mean, my, that was my, my first experience. And then um, while I was at Berkeley my freshman year, I, I was majoring in psychology. And, you know, I enjoyed it. But, you know, rat psychology was not really the way I wanted to spend my life. And they had one filmmaking course. And um, uh, I took that one course and loved it. So I decided to transfer down to UCLA to major in motion picture production. And uh, what I really wanted to be at that point was a camera operator because I loved capturing images. And um, once I graduated, I didn't really have any connections in the in the industry. And I had been doing stills while I was at UCLA. Quite often, right. my teacher would do interviews for the free press or other underground press, mm-hmm. and I'd come along to take the photos, which is how I did portraits of Jimi Hendrix when I was 20 years old. And um, so I had managed to put together a really nice portfolio of stills. But as I said, I had no connections in the movie industry, so I started working for the underground press. And um, that led to eventually my next-door neighbor uh, saw my portfolio, and and she was Robert Mitchum's daughter. She used to do um, photographs for low-budget films. And huh. she saw my work and she said, oh, you know, you would, you would love doing photos for movies. And she had just been offered a job and she wasn't going to be in town for it, and so she recommended me. So I took my portfolio and showed it to the, uh, the, the director who was going to be making this little low-budget film. And he loved the pictures, so he hired me. And that was really my first experience shooting on a movie. I mean, the movie was so terrible, it was never even released. But the great <laughs> part about it was that the script supervisor was Deborah Hill. Wow. Um, and when Deborah Hill went on to make Halloween with John, she looked back at all the people she'd worked with and put together a crew of all the people that she enjoyed working with the most. And um, she called me and she said, would, you know, would you like to work on this movie? It's, 
it's low budget, you know, we, we can pay you, you know, $50 a week or something, or, I mean, it was some ridiculously low amount, <laughs> but, um, uh, I, you know, I enjoyed the work so much, I said, sure. So that was, that turned out to be Halloween. Wow. Okay, so backtracking a little bit there. So, um... You had, you transferred to UCLA and you were you were a film student there, right? Yes. Right, and then you started covering all the rock concerts around LA. Is that what, how it happened? Yeah, I was covering all all the rock and roll and popular culture and you know various interviews that people would do with uh, you know people who would come to town promoting books or whatever. So and people would come to the UCLA campus too to speak. So I photographed Dr. Spock and Shirley Chisholm and all kinds of interesting people who spoke at UCLA. Wow. And you're hanging around the uh, the Sunset Strip, um, um, famous rock clubs like the Troubadour and Leadbetters and Ciro's and all those places? Uh, I occasionally shot at the Troubadour or at the, the Roxy or um, the Whiskey. Yeah, I mean that must have been just uh, just a magical time just to be at those places and seeing, you know. The oh yeah, pe- and they didn't restrict cameras then. I mean now. Yeah. Everybody has a, a cell phone, so everybody's shooting pictures. But if they see you have an actual camera, they don't let you shoot. Yeah, yeah. Every it's ridiculous. Pl- They're okay with getting you know mediocre pictures, but they don't want good pictures. <laughs> Yeah, every place of business has a, a surveillance camera, but you can't get a picture camera to take pictures of things, you know, and you have to have permission, of course, but, you know, you, yeah. generally you can't do it no more. Yeah, It's, it's, a, it's definitely harder now for, for people who are trying to get into it. I know, it's, it's, it's weird. Oh, my God. But, like, when you were in those clubs, like, who did you see? Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> all of the uh, the major artists of the late 60s and early 70s. All the ones that, some of them were signed to labels, some of them weren't, they were just, you know, cutting their teeth. Oh, most, most of them, I think, were signed to labels by the time they were playing those clubs, but um, uh, I, I remember I used to go with my teacher, he'd do the light show for, uh, for the Doors, and the doors were appearing each week at a at a floating club called Kaleidoscope. It was at a different location each week, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> so Bill Kirby, my teacher, would run the light show, and I'd go along and help with the light show, and occasionally take some photos. And um, I remember once we were doing it for the doors, and I was backstage with a keyboard that was tied into various lights. So when you press the keys, different lights would turn on. Wow. And uh, Jim Morrison wandered backstage and. He saw what I was doing, and he sat down on the bench next to me and kind of leaned on all the keys and then looked up suddenly to see how all the different lights were going on. You know, I mean, he was yeah. so ripped. It was just unbelievable. And we used to take bets on whether this was the night he was just going to keel over dead into the audience. He was always led to the stage and led off again. Yeah. <laughs> I bet, bet you anything, when he died, everyone thought it was a hoax. <laughs> well, it, 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 it didn't come as a surprise. Yeah, <laughs> I saw your uh, your online portfolio on your website. I mean, you got to shoot some famous rock legends. Um, Jimi Hendrix, tell me about him. Uh, well, that was for an interview that my teacher did, and uh, I I just kept the camera up to my eye during the whole thing, and you know, waiting for different changes in expression and stuff like that. He was very shy and and sort of soft spoken, mm-hmm. and I didn't realize he was flirting with me. <laughs> I didn't find that out until many, many years later when um, my photos were used in a book called Classic Hendrix, which is a gorgeous book, and it has pictures of him from all over the world, from major photographers. And um, the the people putting the book together said, is there any chance we could get a hold of the original interview that was done when you were taking the pictures? So I got them in touch with my teacher. And then I got the book, and I opened it up, yeah. and... Um, Basically, my teacher said, you know, I don't remember much about the interview. I only did them to get free tickets to concerts. But one (laughs) thing was that uh, Jimmy just couldn't take his eyes off our still photographer, Kim. He thought she was so cute. And I read this and I said, what? And I showed it to my daughter, who was uh, a teenager at the time. And she said, oh, my God, Mom, you mean you were a babe back then? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, it all came as a surprise to me. I was totally oblivious, you know. I was just shooting what I was seeing. Oh, that is so awesome, yeah. Uh, Rod Stewart, what was he like? 
Well, I just shot him in performance, so mm -hmm. I don't know. He was with Small Faces then, and it was at the Crystal Palace in London. Okay, yeah. My uh, dad saw him with the faces at the Fillmore in San Francisco in 1971 and said that he just did a, a killer, killer show. And oh, yeah. And, of course, he, he kicked soccer balls into the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the drawbacks to what I do is that when I'm photographing something, all of my energy is in my eyes mm -hmm. and all of my other senses shut off. So I missed some of the greatest concerts ever because I was photographing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can't ask me what was said at an interview or how the music was because all I know is how it looked. Yeah. <laughs> like like the Grateful Dead, right? I mean, that must have mm -hmm. been insane to be in the, the crowd with all the deadheads there. Oh, it was fabulous. <laughs> it was fabulous. In fact, you know, I, I had so many adventures because after I did all this rock and roll stuff and then, you know, got into doing movies and television, so many people commented on how, how much fun my career was and said I should write a novel about it. Yeah. So I did. Uh, it's not published yet, but it's called Lens Woman, and I wrote it as a romance novel because it made it more fun to write. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow, I can't wait till you publish that. That's going to be cool. Oh, I'll let you know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I see you also took uh, Cheech and Chong. I actually interviewed Tommy Chong back in March. Uh -huh. He's a He's a great guy, yeah. They Did, were fun to photograph because they're so animated. Yeah. <laughs> Did you meet them? No, just photographed them. Just photographed them. How about Andy Warhol? Yeah, Andy Warhol, it was, that was interesting. They, they, it was an interview at the Polo Lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel, mm -hmm. which is a, kind of a garden lunchroom, so the light is very soft and nice. And I sat opposite him at the table and just kept the camera up to my face, waiting for any change of expression. Because with Warhol, every picture you see is the same expression, and I didn't want the same picture. And he was with two of his friends, uh, Sylvia Miles and... Uh, I think Morrissey, the director, mm. and they were doing all the talking. I mean, Warhol literally didn't say a word during the entire interview. And at some point, I think Sylvia Miles said something that amused him. Uh, he got this little smile on his face, and I got the picture I wanted. <laughs> and so I have one of the only pictures of Warhol smiling. <laughs> nice. And then, let's see, Linda Ronstadt with the Eagles, I mean, they, they pretty much reinvented West Coast rock and roll at that time, you know? Um, oh, the best. Yeah, like, yeah, that must have been great seeing them. Absolutely. How about... Um, and and, and, oh. I, and their, their music is music I still listen to when I'm not taking pictures. Oh, yeah, their music is just, um, it's just, it's got these, you know, beautiful harmonies and the beautiful, you know, country rock sound, you know, it's like, by that point, you know, um, folk, folk rock was still kind of around, but surf music was, was gone, but they found new ways to, like, reinvent this West Coast sound. Yeah, and then and then there was Graham Parsons. I photographed Graham. Mm -hmm. um, it was only a few months before he died, and uh, we had taken Cameron Crowe with us <clears throat> to um, to his manager's house because we were going to introduce Cameron and and Graham Parsons. And uh, they did the interview, and Graham said, "You know, you might want to stick around because I just met this this girl, this terrific girl, wonderful musician. She's coming over this afternoon, and uh, it was Emmy Lou Harris." And so Emmy Lou and Graham spent the afternoon jamming while I photographed, and Cameron and my husband, you know, got to watch and listen, and it was just a magical afternoon. And um, and just a few months later, he was he was gone. So it's one of the, the oh. few times that uh, he was photographed with with Emmy Lou just at home jamming together. Oh, wow. And that I heard you say in a previous interview that your favorite was Bob Marley. Oh, well, my husband was his publicist during the mid-70s. Oh. And it was his job to introduce him to the American public. So we got turned on to reggae, you know, early. And um, got to travel down to Jamaica and hang out with him in his house and travel around the island, photograph all the different reggae performers. And... Uh, my my son learned how to read by the time he was three because he wanted to read the liner notes on the reggae albums. He he considered himself a Rasta. <laughs> Did you get high with him? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You kind of have to, just like with Tommy. Oh, sure. Jo- just like with Tommy I mean, Jones. I don't think he would trust someone who wasn't willing to get high with him. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And when I when I did the High Times cover session, I mean, the, the picture I took of Bob with a lot of herb on a table in front of him was the I think it was the most popular cover High Times ever ran. And that session was just done in a little motel room in West Hollywood, and we took our our two-and-a-half-year-old son with us because he really wanted to meet Bob. Mm-hmm. And he had his little little yellow knit Rasta cap on. And so I have one picture where Bob is laughing just looking at my son, which he's now in his 40s. He has that on his wall. Oh. <laughs> Going back to uh, what you are saying about the, uh, the, the Joan Baez rally, like wh- what was that experience like overall? Was it intense? Uh, it, it was fascinating because the crowd just kept growing and growing and growing until it was a sea of people. And, uh, and you know, Joan was performing for the crowd, and it was just, it was very exciting. And it was, you know, all for free speech. Mm-hmm. Was there a lot of cops around? Um, not at that moment, but uh, when, when they took over the administration building, then the cops moved in and cleared people out. Wow. But but they won. I mean, we got the free speech area back, and and uh, it was a very very successful protest. Yeah. Now it seems like nobody's winning. <laughs> you know. Oh uh, well. <laughs> don't get me started on politics. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, going back to John Carpenter, now you get you get involved with his films. Did you like horror? I was not really a horror fan, even today, unless a movie is really critically acclaimed for just being great filmmaking. I, I rarely see horror films. Mm-hmm. And making a horror film is not scary at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, making a horror <laughs> film is just fun. Yeah. Anything stand out from Halloween? Oh, just it was, it was like working with, with a group of your best friends. It was like, like a high school project where, you're, where you love everybody you're working with. And John really understood how important the stills were going to be to help sell the film and, and establish it in, in the public consciousness. So he made sure I got every opportunity I needed to get the, the pictures I wanted. I didn't have a blimp on my camera at that time, which is what makes your camera soundproof so that you can shoot during sound takes. So if it was a scene where people were talking quietly inside, um, it, I, I couldn't really click or it would be picked up by sound so quite often john would say okay do it again for kim once he had it in the can Mm -hmm. and you never find a director who is that supportive of the still photographer you know making Mm -hmm. sure that they get what they need and so just it was just a a non-stop pleasure so I, i don't know how this works so he so they shoot um, you know, they shoot the film, you know, the scene, and then do they have the, uh, they have you, the photographer, come in and then, you know, um, do stills of what was just filmed? Is that how it works? Well, well usually I, I can shoot while, both during the rehearsals and during the shooting, okay. uh, particularly if it's outside, and a lot of it was outside. Um, if it's something in a more constricted place or more difficult access, like uh, when Annie gets killed in the car, mm-hmm. the only angle that could be shot from was through the car window, which is where the big movie camera was. So I said to John, you know, be sure to give me this one, John. And he said, okay. So when they finished shooting Annie's death scene, they pulled the big camera out of the car window and he said, okay, Kim, get in there. And he said, okay, guys, do it one more time for Kim. And I was able to actually direct them a little bit so that I could get the angle, of, so you'd be able to see the angle of the knife and you could see her face, you know, there'd be enough light on her face. So um, that was great. And it only took me, you know, 30 seconds to get what I needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, to have a director who's willing, you know, to take that extra 30 seconds and let you get what you need is just fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> leaps and bounds there for sure. Uh, was it mostly night shoots? Um, it was about 50-50, I guess. 50-50, yeah. But there was I, a lot of stuff <clears throat> with the, you know, the, the girls walking on the streets or, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there, there were a lot of night shoots. Yeah. But John never went over a, a 12-hour day at the most. I mean, he was really a very responsible director. He would um, 
uh, you know, plan everything out. He would do storyboards. He knew shot by shot exactly what he needed because he knew what he needed when he got into the editing room and how it would cut together. So he was a very, very efficient filmmaker. And he was very good at communicating to the crew exactly what he needed so everybody knew what they needed to do. And uh, it just made everybody's job easier. Mm -hmm. I talked to PJ Souls and Sandy Johnson. They told me they loved working on the movie too, you know, and they do, they do conventions like, you know, every weekend <laughs> for oh, the movie. Yeah. yeah. They take a lot of pride in it. <clears throat> How about uh, working on the fog? Uh, that was fun because we got to go on location. So it was, uh, you know, up in Northern California, they chose the foggiest place in the United States. Right. And uh, shooting fog is a challenge because it reflects a lot of light and it's uh, hard to take accurate light readings. And uh, sometimes we'd be shooting in, in rather small rooms. And so the only place I could shoot from was if I was directly underneath the movie camera and, you know, to get the same angle they were getting. And, of course, when you then put fog in the scene, fog starts at the bottom and fills up, you know, from the bottom up. So I'd be covered with fog before it ever got to the movie camera. <laughs> <laughs> did, did they shoot, did they shoot um, up in uh, Pacifica? Uh, it was, um, oh gosh, what was the name of the place where we shot? I have a terrible memory, that's why I take pictures. <laughs> Yeah, because I, th cause th I think he said it was like, um, yeah, in the Pacifica, Half Moon Bay, something like that area. Because I'm I'm born and raised in San Mateo, so I'm very familiar with the area. Right. Um. Hang on. Let me look in my book because I have all that information in my book. Mm. If if your listeners have not seen my book and they're fans of John Carpenter, they would really enjoy it. It's called On Set with John Carpenter, mm -hmm. published by Titan in the UK. And, okay, let's see here, The Fog. Um, sorry about this. It's okay, it's okay. Um, most of it was shot at Point Reyes, which okay. is about 40 miles north of San Francisco. Okay, yeah. And it's considered the second foggiest place in the USA after Nantucket. Okay, yeah. And some of it was shot at Bodega Bay, which is yeah. where Alfred Hitchcock shot the birds. Right. I was trying to think um, the name of the place where, where Hitchcock shot the birds, Bodega Bay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, how about Escape from New York? Escape from New York was mostly shot in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. They had uh, they had one week, I think it was one week in um, in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and at that time, um, the Camera Guild was actually three separate unions. There was one on the East Coast, one that covered the middle of the country, including Chicago, and then the thirteen Western states. And um, you you couldn't you couldn't travel from one to the other to work unless production hired a standby crew so mm. that people from that region weren't losing work because of you. So um, Escape from New York was the first union film that we did, and because Deborah wanted to keep all the people she'd been working with, she signed contracts with us to do Escape from New York before she signed her union contracts, which meant they legally had to let us work on the film, even though we were not yet in the union. And once we got 30 days on the union film, we could all join the union. So she managed to get me and Dean Cundy, the director of photography, and Ray Stella, the camera operator, and Clyde Bryan, the camera assistant, all of us. She got us all into the union, which was absolutely miraculous because it was such a catch-22. You know, you couldn't get into the union unless you had 30 days on a union film, but you couldn't work on a union film unless you were in the union. So the fact that she found that way around it and got us in was just fabulous. Wow. And I am grateful to her every day of my life for that because now that I'm retired, I don't have to live on just Social Security. I have my union pension as well and, and retiree health care, and it is such a blessing. Oh, that's wonderful, yeah. Wow, 30 days on a union film, that's all it took. It's probably different now. <laughs> no, it's still, it, it, oh. still, if you can get 30 days work on a union film, you can get into the union. But it's easier now because you, if you can prove that you have worked 100 days 
Mm -hmm. in a three-year period on any combination of union or non-union work and prove that you were paid for it, you can get into the union. Okay. Yeah. No. That's, that's a change. What, what were the, um, the union fees back then? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. They're a lot, they were a lot less than they are now. Yeah, they're like $10,000 or something now. Yeah, but it's an investment in your entire future. Yeah. <laughs> now, Halloween 2, I mean, that's a completely different ball of wax because it was a, a major uh, studio. It was Universal backing it. What was, uh, what was the, the energy like on that set? Uh, very different. Yeah. It was, was there a lot of tension and just a lot of yes. yelling and there all of that? The director was, was inexperienced and didn't understand a lot of uh, basic things like the adjustment process that mm -hmm. happens before each shot right. where everybody finds the place that they can work from. Right. And for me, that generally consisted of checking with the camera operator, with Ray Stella, to make sure that he wasn't catching my reflection on the set anywhere you know, to make sure that I was in a safe spot. And uh, if the director heard him mention my name, like Kim, shift to the right a little bit more, yeah. he'd, he'd just kick me off the set instead of allowing the adjustment process. Oh my so God. I was getting kicked off the set a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty frustrating. Yeah, I guess... I, you know, I did the best I could, but it was frustrating. I guess without John there, you know, I mean, he did, I think, didn't he executive produce the movie or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he and Deborah produced it. I, I guess without him, his absence there, I guess, you know, they probably figured they could do anything they want, you know, with, you know, his people, you know. Well, also, I'm, I, he, he was, he, the director was sort of insecure, and I don't think he fully trusted the crew. Mm -hmm. And so they'd do a shot, and he'd ask Ray how it was, and Ray would say, that's, it's fine. And he'd say, well, let's do it again. I, he, I, I don't feel that he really felt comfortable and the, the crew was all doing their best. It was all John's crew, you know. We were used to working with each other, and, you know, it was a really efficient crew. But um, he just kept a very strict pecking order, and, you know, some people he wouldn't talk to. You know, he'd only talk to, like, department heads. And so it was a very different experience. What, was the, the, the cast at least uh, nice? I've talked to a couple of people from the cast. Well, the cast was wonderful. I, I love the cast. Yeah, Lance Guest. Um, I've talked to Lance Guest and Jeffrey Kramer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about working on Christine? Oh, Christine was a blast. I was I was pregnant with my second son during Christine. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a lot of times when we'd be, you know, like when they were going to blow up the gas station. Uh, they had built that gas station so they could blow it up. And, but cars kept driving in off the highway to get gas, not realizing that it was just a set. And um, I shot that from the top of a 20-foot ladder, and I had people spotting me from below to make sure I didn't get blasted <laughs> off. And sometimes they'd build little barricades for me to, to protect my belly. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, especially if you, if, you, if your belly button went from an innie to an Audi at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when you're pregnant on a movie set, your, your belly sort of becomes community property. Every, everybody is patting your belly and, you know, feeling yeah. part of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so if your second son was born on Christine, that means he's the same age as me. I was born June 6, 1983. Yeah, yep. I'm, so I'm technically I'm technically six months older than Christine because Christine came out in December of '83. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, even though you know I was you know I I was probably conceived as uh, Christine was being conceived. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you have a favorite of, of of all the movies you worked on of of John's? Oh gosh, um, no, just working with John. Just working with John was one was one of the high points of my life. On everything. Yeah. How come you stopped? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. How come you stopped working on his movies after Christine? Um. Well, after Christine, actually, Escape from New York was the last one we actually shot uh, together. They weren't shot in the order they were released. Um. There were union rules about seniority, um, and I didn't have any seniority because I had just gotten in. 
Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that if you had a history of working with a director, that you could be grandfathered in, that they would allow you to work the production. No one told me that. So they only told John that he had to hire off the available list of the people with seniority. So I ended up not working on his next film, which was The Thing, mm-hmm. and uh, which in retrospect was probably just as well because everyone froze their asses off on that film. They were so cold, and I do not deal well with the cold. Yeah. I've lived in Southern California for so long, I've become a total sissy when it comes to weather. So, um, <laughs> But it, it was a shame because I loved being part of his team. Yeah, but then you went to work for Paramount Television. How did that uh, happen? Well, the union has an availability list, and if you're mm-hmm. not working, you put your name on it each week, and um, companies will call in if they need a crew member. And one day, Cheers called in because they needed a photographer for that night, and so I got to shoot Cheers. And I enjoyed it so much, and they liked having me, and they... Uh-huh. And that turned into a nine-year job, which was really wonderful. Nine years working on the Paramount lot. And during the same period, I, I kind of specialized at the end of each season in doing a great crew shot where I'd bring in ladders and planks and make sure every single member of the crew was clearly visible mm-hmm. and, you know, take a, a crew shot. It was usually about 90 to 100 people. And um, Family Ties asked me to come do it for them. And they were so thrilled with the result that they asked me to come shoot the show the next season. So I ended up shooting Cheers for nine years and Family Ties for five years mm-hmm. simultaneously. And at, at that time, they opened a child care center on the lot at Paramount, which meant that my, my son, Ethan, who was, you know, born after doing Christine, uh, at that point, he was uh, almost three, and I had just given birth to my daughter. Mm-hmm. So uh, they got to be in the child care center while I was working, and in between breaks, I could go to the child care center, which was right next door to the sound stage, to nurse my daughter and see my son. So they grew up as Paramount babies. Yeah, oh, that's great. <clears throat> uh, family ties, yeah, I'm actually going to be talking to Skippy uh, next week, uh, Mark Price. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, That was a wonderful show to work on, too. It was really terrific. Yeah, but... And uh, and Michael J. Fox is just just an amazing actor. I mean, his sense of comic timing is probably the best I've ever seen. He knew exactly how long to hold off before giving a punchline to get the maximum effect. He was just fabulous. And... um, and working on Cheers with director Jim Burroughs. Jim Burroughs is the best director in sitcoms that ever was. He knows what's going on in all four cameras at all times, and he knows when to stop a scene because a camera wasn't at its mark on time and a joke was just about to be, you know, the punchline was just about to come so that the punchline wouldn't be given and have to be done again and lose the audience reaction. Uh, His absolutely phenomenal how on top of everything he was what about working on star trek next generation Mm-hmm. oh uh, that that was fun too although the hours were really long i can imagine mm-hmm. especially had with, a few 18 hour days which those are killer yeah especially you know with the, applying the the actor's makeup you know and stuff like that yeah but i love documenting all that i, I see that you also worked on uh, amazing stories what was that like Oh, that was great, because each week we had a different director. Yeah. So I got to work with Steven Spielberg. I got to work with him for three days on the episode called The Mission. And that was amazing, because he's like a little kid. He gets so excited when he gets the shot that he was going for. You know, he practically mm-hmm. jumps up and down. And uh, I got to work with Clint Eastwood on one episode, and yeah. Paul Bartell. And it was, it was great. It was really a wonderful experience. Did you get to work on the Scorsese episode? Remember. Yeah, it's the one where Sam Waterston, he looks at himself in the mirror, and I can't remember what the outcome of it is, but he's just like a really mean actor, and something happens involving a mirror. That's all I remember about that one. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at my proof sheets. I, that's my memory, is I keep proof sheets from everything I shoot, and that way I've got a memory of it. 
Or how about the or how about the one where the where the where the teenage boy is magnetic? <laughs> I don't remember. That episode scared the shit out of me when I was a kid and I told the the nerd girl who ends up being magnetic at the end. I told her when I first started this podcast, she was a, a guest and I told her how much it terrified me and she laughed out loud because <laughs> she said it, it terrified a lot of people. They they, they made it super horrific. <laughs> So you're mostly retired uh, these days. Like, um, so what do you? So are you just uh, doing books nowadays? Yeah. Well, I, I wrote that first book, Lens Woman, uh, over a period of about ten years because I I wrote it and then I put it away for for ten years and took it back out to see if it was embarrassing or to see if it was a good read. And it was entertaining enough that I joined a, a critique group from the Women's National Book Association, and mm-hmm. I rewrote it three times. And uh, now I'm really happy with it. And then in October of 2019, I went to Florence, Italy for a few weeks because my brother's wife always is an artist and her work is always in their Biennale um, art show in Florence. And so they go and they rent a five bedroom house with frescoes on the ceilings and they bring friends and each friend, you know, rents one of the rooms so it cuts down the cost. And they invited me to go. so. I had never been to Italy before. I was very excited, so I went with them, and I fell in love with Florence, absolutely fell in love. And so when I got home, I sat down to write a novel. I was basically just channeling the characters from the Renaissance, and I spent the whole uh, plague year in the late 15th century, which (laughs) which was a wonderful retreat for me. Yeah, wow. <clears throat> I want to go to Italy someday. I mean, I'm half Italian on my mom's side of the family, and it's always she's never been to Italy either. It's it's uh, always been a goal of ours. Florence is so wonderful. It's like walking back into the Renaissance. You know, there are no yeah. no metal and glass buildings. You know, it's all as it was hundreds of years ago, and it just was so inspirational. So, so I wrote a a, a novel called Caterina by Moonlight. And it takes place in the late 15th century. Nice, nice. What do you think now? You know, there's there's digital, um, you know, cam- there's digital, you know, cameras, and people are using their phones to take pictures. There's like not yeah. many cameras these days. Like, like what, like what do you think about it? Well, it's a real problem for still photographers working on movie and television sets. Um, the actors lose patience because everybody's got their their cell phone cameras and producers think oh well we don't really need a still photographer because everybody's got a camera right and that's it's just it makes it very very difficult and also i worry about um just people in general shooting digitally these days because people have a tendency to shoot off a hundred pictures because they're not having to spend money on film but Mm -hmm. then what do they do with those hundred pictures they're mostly going to be the same how do you find one that's really worth keeping out of all of them Mm -hmm. and how do you archive them so that five years from now or ten years from now you can still access them right i mean i still you know my negatives from 40 years ago are just as good now as they were then but the stuff the first stuff i ever shot digitally maybe you know 20 years ago i don't even know Mm -hmm. how to find it so it's it's uh it's a whole different situation I know. I, I I haven't used a disposable camera since 2009. That's how long it's been. I just use my cell phone, and I do worry about, you know, losing pictures, you know, with, you know, internet crashing and all of that stuff. But, uh... Um, yeah, I mean, if, if I had any advice for photographers starting now, mm-hmm. it would be, first of all, choose your shot. Don't just shoot indiscriminately hoping that you get something. Right. You know, choose your shot. And then back up your work at least three different ways and label it so you know who you shot and when you shot it and where. Because my big problem now is I have, you know, I have all these, you know, proof sheets and negatives, but I didn't always label them well, so I don't always know who's on them. And so that's a problem. Right. So label your stuff well. Right. Do you have, uh, have, so you have books uh, with your photos in them, right? Yes, I have two coffee table photo books uh, on set with John Carpenter and Bob Marley and the Golden Age of Reggae. And they're both from Titan Books in the UK. 
uh, distributed by Random House in this country. And uh, neither of my novels is published yet, but I've got my fingers crossed. Looking, looking for a good agent. <laughs> nice. Yeah, do, do, do you know Steve Carver? No. He um, was a photojournalist when he was younger, and then he became a, a low-budget filmmaker in Hollywood. And now um, that he's retired from that, he's back uh, to photos. He came out with a book that has, like, some of them are his and some of them are other people's that got licensed to him of, like, character actors on set of Western movies throughout history. And I, he, sent, he sent me the book. Oh, my God, it is so beautiful. And he explained to me the whole process of, you know, restoring these pictures and going into the photo lab and just touching them up and making them look better and all that. And it was, it was quite interesting, you know. Um, he, 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 he went on a long, like 20 minute rant about all of this stuff. I thought I was going to fall asleep, but I was really, really, you know, um, touched by what he was telling me about it. You know, photography is, is just, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a lost art of the, of the past. And now digital has taken it over. <laughs> yeah. But um, I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Kim, and I hope uh, you do get that uh, memoir finished and that um, I will get, I will get um, those, those books that uh, you brought up, the On Set with John Carpenter, it's called. Mm-hmm, On Set with John Carpenter. Yes, I will check that out. And in the meantime, you have a happy holiday st- season and please stay safe. Oh, you too. I've, I got my booster, so I'm feeling pretty good. Wonderful. Yep. I, I, yeah, I need to get my booster. I've been vaccinated twice, but I need my booster as well. I just got my flu shot a couple of weeks ago, at least. Well, have yourself a great day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Kim Gottlieb Walker. Ain't she a sweetheart? What a great lady, huh? And I'm so glad we got to talk today about her journey in photography, and the onset of iconic movies and TV shows. That's amazing. She got to work with Carpenter and then work in television like that. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.